Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's event called Inside the Virtual Parliament. My name is Arik Chowdhury, I'm the Director of WebRoots Democracy. For those who don't know, uh, WebRoots is a technology policy think tank uh, which has a particular focus on digital democracy. So we're very excited about today's event and very excited about the Virtual Parliament in general. Uh, I'll be moderating today's discussion and joining us. I'm very pleased to have an excellent panel consisting of Abhinav Pongasare, who's the newly elected MP, uh, Labour MP for Erith and Thamesmead. We uh, should hopefully have Hannah Bardell joining soon, who's the Scottish, Scottish National Party MP for Livingston, but Naz Shah, who's a Labour Member of Parliament for Bradford West. Uh, and also we have joining us um, Matt Stutley and Nicola Spicer from the Parliamentary Digital Service, uh, who have been designing and delivering the virtual parliament. Uh, Matt's role is the Director of Software Engineering and Nicola is Head of Software Delivery. So to begin with, um, I want to start with NAS because there's a very interesting uh, event situation which happened I think about a year ago uh, where you were forced to vote during a Brexit vote whilst you were ill and I thought it would give quite a good context uh, for how we, we're getting into this kind of situation where a lot of MPs are demanding uh, remote methods of working, remote methods of voting. And not everyone who's uh, attending today will know what Parliament is like, has been to Parliament. So Naz, if you're able to maybe give a bit of background to uh, you know, how uh, Parliament works, how voting works, and in particular, give a back, bit of background about that situation you were in personally, uh, a year or so ago uh, during the Brexit uh, debates. Hi, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me, Eric. It's uh, a pleasure to be here with you all. And lovely to see my parliamentary colleagues, even if it's virtually, uh, Benner and uh, Hannah. Um, so last, it was a couple of years ago, actually, we, so I've had a recurring um, nerve injury as a result of a hit and run a few years ago. And sometimes it hospitalises me. But when it's hospitalises me, it is, the level of the injury is as such that I'm literally on gas and air to get out of the house and I was on morphine and I'm sometimes I've been in 10 days five days or whatever and at that point we had the Brexit vote and they said look you've got to come into parliament so the, the usual procedure is they nod you through so convention is you go into parliament into the ground you've got to be in the ground and somebody a whip will come out one of the Tory whips the, the government whip our whip and they will together note your voting intention that you've got to be on in the uh, in the palace grounds um, so we did that and discharged myself from hospital against medical advice and um, went down literally like down the back of a car all the way there and when we got there we were told um, no you've got to come in and imagine so I've just come in my pajamas I'm high on morphine I'm really not awake um, I, I was only going to be in to nod and then I had to spend three hours on a couch inside Parliament whilst they did the debate and then I was able to vote and then I couldn't walk because I was um, really, really um, unsteady on my feet and I had, because of the morphine, I'm sick a lot. So it was the most undignified experience of having a sick ball, a hospital sick ball in my lap with my pyjamas on um, and going through the voting lobby. And then because the voting lobby, once you've come out of it, you can't go back into it. So the only way out is a really long way out. So we tried to go through the chamber and then obviously it got picked up by the media. Um, it was very, very undignified. We'd never expect anybody as lawmakers in, in their jobs, in their day jobs to come into work in those conditions. And yet it was okay for, for us to be. So, I felt, so it was um, horrible, but then we had, um, I think it was Jo Swinson who was also pregnant. And then we had Tulip Vadik. Uh, pregnant and because of those pregnancies and um, they, they were literally voted the day before they gave birth kind of thing and then Tulip had to be wheeled in, in a wheelchair uh, so it's very archaic and it's very old but but I get it I get the idea so I, I miss being in the chamber I miss being in the um, having those debates right now with Covid what I do what I do feel is that we can't hold ministers to account because right now as the system is, you apply for a debate, and um, you might get, so on two occasions, I've been drawn for a debate in the top 100, because everybody's applying for them. And then you might not get, and then there's been times where I've got to number 25, 
but the questions never get to number 25. So you'll only get about 15 questions asked. And if you're not making the top, top 15, 20, you're very unlikely to get called. So from, your, from a constituent's perspective, because you're not, you're not physically, even though you might be sat at home watching the debate and contributing to it, the only way your constituents are going to know that you've contributed, well, not physically contributed, but that you're on top of your workload is if you're constantly tweeting about it or if you're doing something else, but not all my constituents watch Twitter and look at all of that. So it's really hard for us to be held to account as an individual MP, what I feel with my constituents, but also it's really hard for me to be able to just even make an intervention in Parliament because there's none of that is left. So for me, where I'm at with the latest uh, Jacob rees Moggs conversation, um, I absolutely appreciate that we can't do our job from Parliament per se, but I also know that as a single parent of three children, and I'm up in my constituency now, and my children are school in, in London, what would I do? Because I don't have childcare in London. So if I go into London and I've got to be in Parliament and it's extra time or whatever, um, I can't leave my kids here because my mum's in a three month um, you know, um, uh, screening thing where she's got to stay away from us. So it's really difficult. Um, so I, I don't feel, it's a real mixed bag, but that was how Parliament worked. Um, thank you to Matt and Nicola for all the work that you've been doing um, and, the, and the parliamentary team that have been doing all the digitising uh, because it has worked. We can vote. We, you know, voting doesn't take long. It's, um, we had a few hiccups when we first started to. Um, so that, that really, that's my experience of it. So, I'm going to go to um, Abana. You can unmute yourself as well. Uh, so you're newly elected MP. Uh, what's that been like for you? you in, in some respects, you've spent almost as much time in the virtual parliament as you have in the in the actual parliament. Yeah, what has that yeah. been like for you as a new MP? Do you feel supported? Do you prefer it? What's actually been like in, as, as your own experience as an MP? Hi, I just want to say thank you for um, organising this. I think it's a good discussion to have. Um, so as a new MP, I guess I'm less tainted by the current um, system in terms of how it's operated for the last few years. Um, I've been very much like a lot of my new colleagues trying to get to grips with how Parliament operates, which is very different to normal work businesses, just in terms of like how you're in the chamber, how you speak when you're talking about the House of Lords, you say the other place, or um, how you refer to the Speaker of the House, you say, either Madam Deputy Speaker or Speaker or Deputy Speaker, there are certain um, languages that you just have to get your head around. Um, I understand why virtual parliament had to take place because of um, the situation that we're in right now. And I was a bit concerned about the fact that, you know, with us MPs, the way we're, we're, we're traveling to all our constituencies, we're likely to be the super spreaders. Um, particularly um, with the work that we do where we're engaging people. So I think it was the right thing to do. I think virtual parliament, I think um, the individuals behind it have done a really, really good job. It hasn't been perfect. But I think we also need to recognize the fact is no one knew that we were going to be in a situation where we had to quickly set up a virtual parliament really quickly. And I think the way it has taken has, has worked really well. Um, I did find it a bit weird when I did my first um, we did my first session in virtual parliament. I was just like, oh my god, we're in the green room, green room. What, what, you know, why can't I see all the MPs? It was just, it was weird, and it was really hard. Like speaking to my laptop. First of all, I had to find somewhere that was kind of like had a blank background, so I can find that, and that's really difficult in my place. Um, to sit there and then I also had my phone on the side to make sure that I was timing my my speeches making sure I was within time because normally when you're in the chamber there's a massive clock on the on the wall. Um, I would say that in terms of the way things have been I think that in a way it's it's particularly the way the circumstances were dealt with I think that um, the way the chamber operates there's a lot of like shouty and it can be quite I think um, bullish and can be sometimes some comments can be quite inappropriate with virtual parliament that takes that away so you don't really you just get straight to the point but as Nasha, there has been difficulties in terms of like 
people getting allocated in terms to speak. But I think that's very much about changing the process, the system, um, which I think is long overdue in terms of how people are selected to speak. Um, I think we need to, to change that so it's a bit more, I guess, in some way kind of fairer. Um, but that's something that will, I think would happen over time. The concerns that I do have about the removal of virtual parliament is that there are individuals, um, MPs, that for various reasons they need to be shielded. Um, last, last night, Jacob rees Mold was asked about that um, from the shadow leader of the House and apparently they're going to be spending recess to, to kind of look at that. Recess has started now um, and it's for the next two weeks. I think surely if you were going to remove this process, this should have been thought about well in advance and not over the next two weeks. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm really concerned about that. I've made it very clear to my staff that they are still going to work from home. I have to come into Parliament back on the 4th of June because I'm going to be sitting on the Finance Bill Committee. Originally, we were going to do those virtually, but the government has decided that they want us to do it physically. I, do, I just want to emphasise the point that you can still do your work effectively, um, remotely, um, just as you can do it physically in the presence um, in Parliament. It just doesn't mean that those that come into Parliament are working harder than those that have worked um, virtually. Um, in fact, I feel that I've probably worked a lot more longer hours because I think when you're in Parliament, you're surrounded by people who would take you aside and say, Abana, you need to go and have a break. Whereas I don't really find that um, by me working virtually. So there is an element of where we need to look at people's mental well-being because I am concerned about the aspect where I've noticed I'm on Zoom calls most of the day. And then if I do unwind, I'm watching the TV. So um, thinking about the fact that we need to just need to get that healthy balance um, and that kind of goes hand in hand. So I think it's a positive step forward. I also just want to add, you know, we're just discussing virtual parliament. We also need to look at local authorities as well. They've gone virtually as well, um, which I think is a good thing. But I'm also hearing from councillors that a number of councils want to go back to the ways it was before. They want to completely scrap virtual councils. I don't understand why um, when it's been working quite effectively and local authorities like Parliament need to modernise as well. Um, I could go on but I know you've got other people that you would like to speak as well. Thank you Evana. Um, I'm going to go to Hannah. You'll need to unmute yourself as well Hannah. Yeah, no. um, me and you have been banging on about e-voting for a number of <laughs> yeah, years. We've been walking this path for quite a long time yeah. yeah. <laughs> So what, like, just building what Evan has said, you know, there is resistance, not just in local authorities, but within Parliament. And yesterday we had this vote where um, the government basically said they're going to scrap the virtual Parliament. So what yeah. is actually going on there? Can you give us some background on what the, the resistances are within Parliament? Sure. Um, and, and firstly, I just want to say thank you, Eric, for pulling this together and, and continuing continuing to bang this drum as you say I think we've been I've been doing events with you since probably about 2015 or 2016 on digital democracy whether that's in parliament or you know further afield and actually what I, I know that that's not what this event is about but I do think there's an opportunity for us to be looking at democracy in general and and the digitization of it and how we vote and all of these because we've we've got a by-election council by-election in my constituency in October and it's going to be a postal only ballot and so I and I know there are big challenges in terms of you know hacking etc but I do think now is the time um, for us to be looking at all of our processes um, democratically um, and, and what we can do to, to modernise. And it shouldn't have taken a global pandemic for us to look at this in Parliament in the same way that it shouldn't have taken for Tulip Sadiq to put off the birth of her child or Naz to have to be... And I remember that day, I remember Naz in her wheelchair sitting right beside me on, when I was sitting on the front uh, bench of the SNP and talking to her and, you know, I just thought, how on earth, what does this look like to the rest of the world, that this is the state that we're in? And, you know, on the one hand, you'll hear the UK government saying we want to lead the world and be, you know, progressive force in the world, etc. and this great power. But on the other hand, we've got these ancient traditions that 
I think are being held on to by fingernails just so that they can cling on to these old ancient traditions which frankly are about being very opaque doing things behind the scenes quiet conversations and and a lot of the pomp and tradition relates to that now I would be of a much more radical mind that that so much of you know I don't believe that the parliament building as it stands is fit for purpose as a parliament okay so I would say up front I think that building needs to be turned into a museum and we need to build a new parliament and it would cost a damn sight more than spending the billions of pounds that are going to of public money you know when frankly people are starving people are dying because of poverty and austerity however in terms of a middle ground and a more pragmatic approach what I would say is I think fantastic work has been done by the digital staff and I just want to thank them personally, Matt and Nicola, on the, the first test day that we did the, the digital voting. It didn't work for me. And Matt was in touch with me at nine o'clock at night saying he wasn't going to sleep if we didn't make it work. Um, and, and, and it has been brilliant. Now, I recognise there are challenges in the flow of debate, um, that it's not quite the same in terms of interventions and people getting taken but actually it's much more organized so you know when you go into the you know into the virtual parliament every day right where you are on a speaking list you can pretty much guess if there's too many people the, the reason at the moment they've got so many people on speaking lists and question lists is they're worried that people will not you know if the technology fails they have to have backup people for statements i think if it's expanded and embedded and further investment, um, then, you know, as Abina is saying, she's supposed to be in the finance bill. There's absolutely no reason why the finance bill committee and other bill committees and Westminster Hall cannot sit virtually. We have proven that the technology can work and now is a huge opportunity to roll it out. So my understanding of all of this being pulled is that we are now going to be in the position, the MP, now me as a Scottish MP, I'm not gonna go against the Scottish government. And the reason I was late, cause I was listening to Nicola Sturgeon's statement and there's nothing, I haven't looked in all the documents. There's nothing in that that indicates to me that it will be okay for me to travel from Scotland down to London and back. And apart from anything else, I live with my 72 year old mother who's in the vulnerable category. My brother has ulcerative colitis. Nobody's got very much sympathy for individual MPs. I, I do understand that. And I think we should be held to the highest possible standards and we should be following the same guidance that other people and our constituents are following. But I don't think my constituents will thank me for going all the way to London, putting myself at risk and putting them at risk when I think, you know, Naz was saying about, you know, we're if we have surgeries, we're meeting very vulnerable people. I just don't understand why we need to do that when we've proven the technology is possible and we're talking about only 50 people can sit in the chamber and we're not going to be able to vote in the lobbies um, rightly so we're potentially going to have to queue up at, at distance and votes will take 45 minutes each that is utterly ridiculous I mean what an absolute nonsense of a joke and that actually will lock out more MPs than the current system of you know hybrid parliament so i would hope that at some point they will see sense because my concern is what's going to have to happen it's always about extremes it's always about you know somebody has to put off the birth of their baby and come into parliament to vote so that we can get proxy voting is it going to take one of us to get ill or pass it on to somebody who then gets very ill i mean that's do you know this just seems completely i don't know nonsensical and also it creates two um, two levels of parliamentarians. So I think it's right and, and positive that people who are shielding are being recognised. But those of us that have got vulnerable family members also mm. is an issue, but also for just the public. The public looking on thinking, we want to have a, I would like to think, have a parliament that reflects society. We're going to be asking people to work in different ways all across the UK and around the world. So why are we not embracing ourselves, the new technology that has been put in place? and that will actually make parliament i think more robust and, res and resilient and again it's about looking so people could get stuck in their constituencies for all sorts of reasons ill health weather you know, transport failures who knows so we should have a system that makes sure people you know also in terms of inclusiveness and making sure we encourage as many people from different backgrounds you know we're still shockingly undiverse you know um and 
you know, we still have a challenge, um, you know, with, with, well, as we've seen, you know, women being able to have children, also fathers being able to take paternity leave for any reasonable amount of time. So all of these things need to be considered. Um, and, and, and if we had virtual, the virtual proceedings embedded and expanded, I think it would make Parliament much more inclusive and reflective of society. So it's not just about the coronavirus and how we deal with the current pandemic. It's about embedding these technologies long term and, and advocating and campaigning for that. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go to, to Matt and Nicola. So Matt, you've been like tasked with this huge task of actually designing this this online voting system and, in, and like like kind of was saying in many ways we're actually um an outlier compared to other parliaments who do have uh, electronic voting systems in place already and obviously there are lots of um huge challenges involved around privacy and security but also around more social issues around uh, user experience people's digital literacy levels but what has that been like for you designing that system, what have been the challenges in designing that system and how has it felt to actually be uh, part of history in this way and designing the first ever remote voting system used in the British Parliament? Okay, hello everyone. Um, this might be your first Zoom conference, this is my first conference thing full stop, so you know, however, however, however well you've organised it, I can, I can lower that bar slightly for you now, so um, I'll do my best to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to not embarrass myself. Um, so we, we, I was asked kind of just before Easter to see if or what could be put together to enable members to work, work more remotely or were able to work in some ways remotely and um, had a few proposals, one of which was around voting. And we, come, we were asked to step that forward yeah, just before the Easter weekend. Um, I have, I have, and I have to continue, I have many other things in my kind of, my little war chest of things we could do with technology, but obviously everything, everything we might want to do has to be agreed by the House. We can't just do things and say to the House, yeah, use this. It doesn't work that, that way. It's the other way around. We have to be asked, can you please give us a facility to do X, Y, or Z? So voting is something that I've kind of pondered for a, a good couple of years now. So it wasn't like, although it was an out of the blue request, it wasn't something that was like, oh my goodness, how on earth are we going to make this happen? It was something that I was able to think, okay, so I've got a broad plan of how this will be done. So um, a couple of years ago, we built a system for members to be able to electronically table their questions. So when uh, a member wants to ask an oral question, say to the Prime Minister, they put their names in a virtual hat. And um, we have a system that kind of picks you out at random. And we also have the system that lets members ask written questions to government departments. So if you want to ask the uh, Ministry of Defence, how, how many tanks did they buy last year? A member might write to the write to the Ministry of Defence, Minister of Defence, and ask them a question. So um, we have a system that does all of that. So it kind of it kind of felt logical, kind of, um, to build on top of a system we already had in place. We already knew it was secure, so you know members already log into it. They're already you know about two thirds of them. Nick can talk about this in a minute. About two thirds of them, all their staff, are using it now, um, kind of to to run their day to day business. So the familiarity was there. So that it, it, the logic was on top of our member hub, let's build in remote voting. Um, same th thing applied to the administration staff. So obviously, you know, members are working in a completely different and challenging environment. And so are all of the staff kind of behind the scenes in Parliament, the clerks and a variety of people who are there kind of making the business of the house work. Their whole world is completely different as well. And so it was really kind of important to me to make sure that we took into account their experience as well because it's, you know okay the members have got that to vote but if no one can then process what comes in at the, at the end of it it's not going to be uh, massively useful so we have a voting system in the lobbies which the members have already alluded to where they would have gone through and given their names to a clerk that's all recorded electronically um, and it's all collated and sent to kind of a central point at the end of the division where the uh, clerks can kind of do some sanity checks and they publish it to uh, the website so Again, kind of logically, we built on top of that as well. So those two systems kind of coming together was 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 our goal. Um, the biggest challenge of all was the time scale. We had, you know it, we had four weeks to do this, which is you know, I don't know of certainly any I say government we're not government but any government public sector IT project that builds and delivers something inside four weeks is unusual. Let's go with that. 
Um, and of course, the, um, there wasn't space for lots of testing and beta testing, which we would normally do just to get some feedback and some feeling to see how it works because the votes are the votes and all votes matter because they all matter to somebody about something. There's no, although kind of from a public point of view, some things are very high profile, all of the votes in parliament matter. So it's not like we can go, oh, this one doesn't matter too much. Let's try it here. We had to make sure the thing we built in place would be ready to go on the day we launched it. Um, so uh, the, the challenge was time, which meant people working a lot of hours. And um, uh, as I've been as well, you know, people, uh, members are working crazy hours because they're at home. It's, it's been kind of the same for us, that kind of switch of, oh, I've got a train, I must get going, so I'll miss my train. That's not there. And suddenly you find yourself working from kind of nine in the morning till nine plus at night, seven days a week for four weeks is surprisingly tiring. Um, but to your kind of question about kind of, you know, the, the reason to do it was so important and to know that, you know, the hybrid proceedings were happening, but there couldn't be any votes. So no legislation could progress and, you know, uh, and, and amendments couldn't be, put, lots and lots of things couldn't happen without Parliament being able to vote. So the fact that we were able to enable that was the kind of the driver to keep pushing us through. Um, had some uh, sort of technical hiccups, of course, in that four-week window. And as I'm sure as anyone who's followed this knows, when we first tried um, a big test, we found the system just creaked under the strain. Um, people have seen, said, because I've, you know, I keep an eye. Oh, how on earth can they build a system that can't support 600 people logging into it at once? Which sounds, yeah, that sounds ridiculous. But because of some of the processes around how Parliament works and how the divisions work actually 600 people logging in ends up with a system having to receive kind of 300 odd requests a second which is actually quite a lot of traffic coming through to a, a website 300 plus requests a second is quite a bit of traffic and so we weren't we hadn't quite factored that in when we started lots of things around whether the, you know, the member has a proxy um as we've already talked about with nas and uh, um and whether the member has uh, whether the division is being extended whether the division is being cancelled has the member voted already? Has the member potentially, because from a technical point of view, the system would support a hybrid. It supports a lobby vote and online. The two things work seamlessly. So lots of checks are going on to make sure everything's behaving as it should. And so suddenly that makes the load very, very high. So we had to do some evolutions to make it cope with all these complicated procedural rules. Um, moved it on, moved it on. Then we did a big test with um, members and that's the test that Hannah referred to where we um, discovered that half, roughly a 50-50 split, half the members could vote, half the members were unsuccessful in voting in our test. And that turned out to be because some members were using parliamentary supplied equipment, i.e. their laptops, and some were using their own phones or, or iPads or whatever. And we built the system to be usable by on any device because we don't want to constrain members. You can vote, but only if you use this device, that's immediately not inclusive. So we had to work out why that wasn't happening quite, you know, again, quite late in the evening so we could kind of build that confidence because we need our users of the system to be confident things were going to behave and work as they should. Um, work, got to the bottom of that, overcame that. Second test much more successful and then we did a, kind of a few more kind of just to make sure everybody got involved and Nick will talk about how she got everybody involved because I mean we, we reached out to 400 MPs across 48 hours pretty much which was a insane logistical exercise. Um, and then, yeah, we, we, put, we put it through the House of Commons Procedure Committee, which is a group of people that, group of MPs who basically decide or make recommendations to the, to the speaker about how things should work. Um, they agreed it was acceptable. The speaker then signed it off. And the first, on the, on the first day, and the first vote happened the kind of following Monday. Um, and every, we've had, I can't count, I remember now the first vote had about 600, just over 600 MPs vote in it. We had a world record on last night of 614 on one, so that was our best ever. Um, and, well, that was, and, the la and the last one as well, which is sad at the same time. Um, but yeah, the challenges were around time and in kind of engagement. Um, but it was, it was something, regardless of where it goes going forward, I am personally super proud of being involved in making it happen. I would, you know, I, I think we've shown it can be done <clears throat> and a lot of the a lot of the kind of feedback in the past was well you, it's just not possible you couldn't possibly make that work and we've shown not only we can make it work we've made it work in a really small time frame and it's worked really really well um and so i'm hoping that at least at least opens the door to discussions and when the house comes back in june that members uh, 
three on the call now are able to at least enable the conversation about where things go next. Not being, well, it just can't be done because we it can. Now it's about, do you want to? And that's, that's all we can do from a technology point of view, really. We enable you to do it. Now you need to choose how you want, how you want to do it. That's incredible. Um, Nicola, just t tell us a, a little bit about your role, but also, um, as I understand it, you, you're, you've been involved in actually engaging with some of the members, making sure they're, they're able to use these systems well. Um, it's important to remember in all of these kind of conversations that not everyone is uh, very digitally literate, right? So, um, as I think it was Ken Clark, who's no longer an MP, but was a long, long serving MP, never had a mobile phone. So, that's the kind of extent of, of some members' abilities with technology. Can you tell us a little bit about your role, but also a bit about the challenges in engaging uh, less digitally literate um, MPs with the system? Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation. It's an honor to be speaking with you all. Um, so my responsibility as part of this project was essentially around overseeing the testing of the system and embedding it and ensuring that the communications was all lined up for this system to be something that A, members were aware of and B, that they were able to effectively use. So it was a, a massive undertaking, as, as Matt has said, and the timeframes were uh, crazy. However, again, the fact that we've managed to deliver it and turn it around on time is testament to the work of lots of different people. So Matt and I, obviously pleased to be speaking with you, but there's a, there's a, there's a much bigger cast behind us that's responsible for some of this delivery too. So one of the most uh, important things that we needed to look at when it came to ensuring that members would be confident using Member Hub, which was the, the application that Matt has talked about building on uh, with the remote voting system. Essentially, we, we had stats that showed us that two thirds of members had logged in and used Member Hub for the tabling of questions. However, we couldn't confirm whether that was the member themselves doing that or a member of their staff actually taking that action on their behalf. So we kind of had a broad idea that there was a, a, a fair level of awareness for Member Hub as a system, but we couldn't actually confirm that that was those members directly being able to log in and use it. So again, what we needed to do within the quick time frame was sort of pull together a very uh, nimble pool of volunteers from across uh, various teams within that within PDS, the Parliamentary Digital Service, and the House of Commons. And essentially, what we did was we we proactively contacted over 600 MPs um, to ensure that they were aware of Member Hub and that there were no initial issues with them logging in. So we had over 60 volunteers that were um, phoning those MPs or speaking to members of their staff um, or speaking with them directly and guiding them through the process of this is what Member Hub is. This is the system you'll be using to um, vote from this particular date. We want to ensure you feel confident with what it is and that you're able to effectively log in and adjust your settings to reflect your preferences. So essentially those, those people took on that, that exercise over 48 hours, as Matt has said. And um, we, within those conversations, we were very quickly able to assess sort of where people were and what the common issues were. So as you said, we, we, do, we do have a pool of, um, MPs and who are not necessarily the most confident with technology and it was really important for us to ensure that we could sort of bolster their confidence as much as possible with this system so by and large where we knew we had um where we had knew we had members who weren't necessarily going to be confident when it came to accessing a new system by and large we would offer them almost one-to-one -one support with it so again a lot of our activities have been in close collaboration with the Chamber and Committee Services team. So we have um, two really close colleagues, Joanna Dodd and Matthew Hamlin, who have been responsible for rolling out a lot of this work with us and reflecting the procedural side of things effectively in the work that we do. We've been engaging with members that have found things a bit more tricky technically on a one-to-one -one basis um, and troubleshooting kind of as, we, as we've gone. So again, that's been a, a really big endeavor on, on a handful of people to kind of establish what the technical issues are and how we can overcome them. We've had um, examples of members that don't use their parliamentary email address as their primary means of communication. That's fine. The system was adjusted to enable them to input a second email address if that was a, a preferential way that they would like to be contacted. The system itself triggers um, text notifications to members' mobile phones when a division is called. 
again, we needed to step members through the process of ensuring that was set up to have their mobile number inputted and for them to receive those notifications if that's what they would like. So a lot of it has been about tailoring the support we've been able to give as far as possible to whatever a particular member needs. The bulk of members, to be completely honest, were fairly confident with what we showed them. The system itself is intuitive and user friendly. That's part of you know, the beauty of it. Um, and when we've had issues that have arisen, we actually offered, um, and it was pretty successful actually, we actually offered um, Microsoft Teams like a drop-in session. So after a couple of the initial tests that we rolled out um, externally to members, where there were any issues that people were worried about, we had an hour long session where members could drop in, share whatever the, the problem was, and we could kind of take that conversation offline and just support them directly. So yeah, the, the engagement piece has been um, immense and fast paced. Um, but I think because everybody shared, everybody has a shared um, commitment towards making this making this work and understands the importance of enabling members to vote remotely. So any any resistance we've found around te technology or, or, or anything else, it, it's been quite quickly overcome just by virtue of the fact that this is absolutely critically important in this environment. Okay. Um, I have a couple more questions for the panelists. Just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, please leave, uh, leave the question in the chat. I'm going to go to Naz. Um, see if this works. So Naz, uh, you actually went into the chamber um, at the beginning, I think, of the pandemic when the, the social distancing measures were put in place. Um, can you tell us a bit about what it's been like on that side of it? And if you know, um, what, do you, what is the plan but after recess when MPs are expected to go back in? Because um, obviously you won't be able to crowd everyone into the chamber or the lobbies. Do you, do you have any inkling of what's going to happen next? Um, so when I went in, we had the social distancing measures in place. So I'll give you an example. In between uh, going into a chamber, not far from the chamber, the tea room, where lots of MPs we usually get together whilst we're waiting for a vote. Uh, when Benna was talking about it earlier, we, we talked to others, we, whether that's the library, but usually, they are absolutely packed, people going in and out. And now, where there were four people to a table, there's only one person to a table. So your kind of capacity has, has gone from, you can literally have eight people sat in one area where there'd normally be maybe 50 or more. Um, so, so it's really, and, and the social distancing is really difficult because even if you've got all your parliamentary staff in, you've got the doorkeepers in, you've got the security people in, you've got all of those, staffers who've got to facilitate us being in Parliament um, and that really really does create lots of you, you, it's, it's really really impossible it's been like like being in the supermarket I suppose how many of us go shopping when we're outside we're in a queue which is two meters apart but once you go in you're going to pass people through the aisle you're going to pass people you're going to uh, there is no way you can maintain that two meter distance whilst you're shopping in Morrisons or wherever in a local shop unless they actually wait for lots of people to come out and it's really, really bare minimum empty, but you're still going to come across people. And the same happens in Parliament. So when I went in, um, it was the first time we had the um, uh, remote sitting. It was eerily, eerily quiet. You know, it was really, really, um, it, it, it felt weird. It, it um, no hustle, no bustle kind of thing. And I think the procedures from um, Parliament's perspective, they're not as swift and they don't, don't run as quick as normal would do. Um, so it just felt a bit weird, but it was it was interesting because it wasn't something you, you just, I, I ended up going in and thinking I was gonna go into the library, do some work in between and then come. But then once we'd done the Prime Minister's questions and then it was like, well, if you're not doing your question, if you're not in the chamber for a, a debate and if you don't want to go in, um, you just kind of leave. So all of that kind of normal bit of being able to pop into the chamber because you've got some time to catch up with something and make an intervention, all of that has gone out of the window. So that doesn't feel brilliant. But, but one of the other things I want to pick up on with um, about home working um, was, and ben, ben mentioned it as well as, you know, and Hannah talked about, that the truth is that when we're working from home, so one of, so, so my staff, like other MPs, have said, you've got to work from home. But there is this productivity issue. So the, for, for me, I'm not having to travel 450 miles a week, which is what my normal journey was packing up my three kids from London uh, from uh, London to Bradford on the weekend and my productivity has kind of like a my workload has gone up massively because we're having to get our heads round our 
for new legislation, of supporting businesses, supporting people who've been furloughed, supporting people on uh, uh, yeah, universal tax credits. But also for staff who've got children, they've got no switch off. You've got absolutely no switch off where you've got, you're continuing to work. So we've, for, for me, personally, it's Ramadan, so it's kind of like, it, it's, I'm working silly hours anyway, because I'm up to three or four in the morning. So I, I find myself on, sat at my desk till late, um, early hours. But there is no kind of, you're not going to work anymore. You, you haven't got that cut off. Um, it, it, it really does impact. And I have had, I have had staff where they've really, really struggled with it. And, I, and at times, you're kind of like, that you just carry on working. So I've been sat literally, because I don't have to get up and for a drink, I'm not fasting today, but to, because I don't have to get up and get a break, you can, yeah, I've been sat solid at my laptop for more than eight hours. And that is not healthy. I mean, you know, because I, I don't need a break so I can carry on. But if, even if I did, and between getting the children, and you've got to homeschool your kids at the same time. You know, you, so I've got three children that are at school. You know, one of them is Mr. GCSE, so she's really not happy. I've had two kids who've had, um, their birthdays in lockdown. I mean, don't get me wrong, it saved me a packet, but it's still all of those things that you've got to deal with with your children. And um, so the work-life balance is, has, it's really, my, my worry is, my worry is that when we come out of this, um, what impact that's going to leave in the long term, not just for us, but for our staff. And that's really, really important because if not, you know, if they can't switch off, I've had to literally have conversations with my staff saying, right, if you've got the children, and change your work, change your whole. It's absolutely cool to not start work at nine o'clock in the morning. It's absolutely cool to because you've childcare responsibility to start at twelve, do so many hours, then do another set of hours, because you, you know, to, to make it and then and then that makes it even harder for somebody who's got a small child. You know, if, if you've got a small five-year-old at home who needs your attention, and if you're a single parent, for example, you've got to school that five-year-old. Five-year-olds need attention. Um, anybody with children, with children absolutely appreciates that and even those with none you know and trying to manage and in some cases we've got laptops but not everybody has a laptop at home that they can use for home things where they can keep their child on so with my laptop my my kids even if i'm not using it can't use it because it's parliamentary system you know so it means making sure that the kids have got their own own things including my eight-year-old so it, it, there is my concern is once we come out of all of this how we'll be dealing with it. I'm um, on the plus side, productivity has gone up because I'm not doing all that commuting. I'm not having to pack three kids mm -hmm. up. I'm not doing, so my work output has increased and I've really enjoyed it. I've really actually enjoyed not having to commute. And I can't imagine what it's like for Hannah, who's a bit further up north than me. <laughs> so yeah. So let's, uh, we're getting a lot of good questions in the chat. Thank you. Um, one, of, one or two of the questions are around the political, barriers uh, to uh, implementing uh, the digital parliament. Uh, I want to go to Abena, um, and then maybe Hannah could comment on this as well. Do you have any thoughts on whether this is going to change uh, the debates uh, within parliament longer term? Uh, do, you, do you see this change in the debate also in, in wider democracy in terms of uh, people with disabilities voting remotely in elections, which is something we've done a lot of research on in the past. Um, do you see that changing as a result of this this very brief experience with the virtual parliament? With the virtual parliament, um, I think that with the experience of the virtual parliament, I think it's still going to take a while before. I think what you're leading to is is it online voting. Um, I'm very much in favour of online voting, by the way, but there is a culture in in parliament. I think that that really needs to change. Um, I think there is a bit of a disconnect where I know with some of the members that aren't very much digitally engaged, they don't see the benefits of that. Um, I think that it's really good, particularly um, with people that wouldn't necessarily be able to go to a polling station um, to be able to have access, to be able to vote online, as long as it's done securely, as the case is, is in Estonia. Um, I think that there should be an option and I think the arguments that people say about it being unsafe are, um, are the same arguments you would say, well, are you happy to do online banking and also go and do postal votes? And so I think it's, it's, I think it's made it a bit easier, but I don't think it's 
we're at the stage yet where everyone's going to be up for let's have in let's change in to go for online voting there are still discussions that need to, need to be had on that and i also don't think it's high on the radar at the moment if i'm going to be completely honest because of what's happened with covid there is so much work that needs to be done in terms of coming out there um, in terms of economic recovery um a lot of people have lost jobs issues about whether, whether schools should open or not i think that's going to take higher priority over whether we should um, move towards online voting but that doesn't mean that individuals that have been lobbying it for a while should stop doing that this is the perfect opportunity to demonstrate why it should be the case because MPs have just recently voted on one of the biggest bills, so immigration bill. So if they can do that, which is essentially going to affect many people's lives across the country, then there should be, then that's a clear argument as to why there should be on voting in this country, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting that, um, I do agree with you, it is, I do think there is an opportunity. Um, as we know, we pushed back the May elections, the mayoral elections next year, and it, it could well be the case that they still can't take place next year. Well, that, before I move on to Hannah, I want to ask Rachel Farrington, who's got her hand up, to ask her a question. Maybe I can... Hi everyone, thank you so much for uh, presenting to us all today. I just have two really quick questions. One for the MPs. Um, I've heard from some MPs that they're finding it difficult to access their front bench. They're not having those lobby chats or those kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I was wondering if you found it difficult to kind of engage with some of the uh, senior MPs in your party. And then for um, the digital team, um, you touched on it slightly, but I'm wondering how much of this did you have ready to go and kind of stored in the back end before this started? Thank you. So let's go to Hannah to quickly answer that and then we'll go on to um, Matt I think really important questions, uh, Rachel, and I think um, it's been a wider question that people have asked about, oh, um, I remember Karen Bradley and the first debate on uh, digital voting and hybrid parliament, oh, we're at our best when we're in parliament, when we're having our conversations in dark corridors, like, come on, this is the 21st century. You should be able to access people digitally. And the next generation, you know, I know, you know, at the ripe old age of 36, nearly 37, I'm looking at, you know, my nieces and also, you know, friends of mine who are even five or 10 years younger than me, who live their, so much of their lives online and do so many things digitally. Parliament is then going to be, it's already really far away, the UK Parliament from people. It's going to be even further away from people and society if it doesn't modernise. So I think it's an, this nonsense about you can't get proper answers from ministers. I hate to, you know, to say it, but minister, you know, the responses we get from ministers and government physically when we're in the chamber are not really any better than the ones that we get virtually so that's a that's a, an existing issue that to my mind doesn't have as really as much to do with the physical aspect i do understand the thing about catching people um, but i just think we need to think about a much better way of working and that the digital world has to be has to play a bigger part in that um, so personally i don't have an issue with accessing my own colleagues and we've been having regular group meetings via zoom regionally nationally local branches i've been doing it within the party you know constituency association meetings um, and 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 i do think we need to get away from that old school westminster a tradition of deals are done in dark corridors because I don't think that that's good for democracy and I don't think it's the right way you know for for things to be to be dealt with. So we're getting loads of really interesting questions in the chat now. Um, I just want to say something about the mishap I, I just saw that I know it's a, a message for the digital team and and of course there's going to be mishaps we've had examples of people getting locked in toilets and you know, going through wrong lobbies. I mean, I guess my view would be, you know, stupid, stupidity and carelessness shouldn't be the enemy of the good. You know, that these are pretty, and, and older members who are maybe not as digitally aware can be trained up and should be trained up so that they can embrace the new technologies. And I just, I think hearing, um, you know, Matt and Nicola talk about the work that they've done, it's, it's truly remarkable. It really is truly remarkable what they have managed to achieve in a very short space of time. And it shows that if we have, we have the capacity and the ability. And I think it would actually be heartbreaking and deeply offensive. I know they maybe won't be able to give their personal opinions on this, for all of that work to be taken away and put in the bin just because 
the go some in the government want to go back to the old school ways of working. I think that's a, a real tragedy and would be a really regressive step. Yeah, it's funny you say the, the older members as well. I, I recall Rishi Sunak actually voted against uh, his own yeah. government as well by accident. Yeah, um, accidents happen and that's, that's a, going to be a feature of, well, you know, we all make mistakes, right? But that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it should thwart progress. For sure. Um, so Matt and Nicola, there's some, some technical questions there. One of them is around um, authentication. Um, and I guess a wider question is what, what were the key, what were the top risks on your risk register um, when developing the voting system, for example? Uh, authentication will be one of them, but did you have things like um, malicious attacks from foreign governments, for example, on there? And how did you, how did you adjust these kinds of risks? So obviously I can't go into a huge technical detail because that would be rather foolish. So um, I kind of an overview level. I guess on the, the point about the Chancellor, I suspect he won't ever do it again. Um, or, or, you know, re remote proceedings is different, isn't it? Maybe maybe he just didn't quite realise what that particular division was on. There were several divisions at the same time, some amendments and one was a third reading. So who knows? Um, it's, it's very hard for us to do anything technically to prevent that happening. I mean, the system tells you what you're voting on. It asks you to confirm your vote. It says you're voting I, and then you say, right, yes. So are you sure you want to vote I? And if you do, you, you have. Um, we can't, we thought about options around having the whips be data through, but it's a parliamentary system. We, we can't let it have a political bent on it because that's really dangerous. What if the Tory whips remember and the Labour whip didn't remember and suddenly the system favours, we, we couldn't do it. So there's just, there's, there's nothing in the system that lets, tells a member how they should vote. We assume the channels that exist now are in place and, and members will get told by the whips, this division's coming up and we expect you to vote this way. I can't, there's not a hell of a lot we can do on, on, that, on that front. Um, on the authentication point of view, obviously we had the, the member hub existed before um, for the point of view of questions and motions. Um, that's all we had, everything else, and we had a lobby voting system. Everything else we built was built completely from nothing um, to answer Rachel's question just now. Um, it was all built in that kind of four weeks. So we've got, um, we have used the same authentication we use for members accessing the rest of the parliamentary network, so accessing their emails and things, for example. So we, we use the same process, which is, you know, username, password, and a multi-factor authentication, which is like, a, you know, anyone that uses online banking will be familiar with. The second code you get sent or you have on your phone, like a rotating 30-second six-digit code kind of thing that tells you, you know, how to log in. Um, that's what we use. We obviously have to trust the users that they're going to keep their credentials to themselves. We can't, we can't enforce that. Um, because we want it to work on any device, we can't bring in biometrics and things. And also there's a whole, if we were to, you know, we were asked about biometrics. Um, there's a whole nother question there about Parliament storing biometric details of all the MPs. I, pretty, I, I'm 100% certain all 650 MPs would not consent to that. So it had to be a, 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 I mean, it had to be a process that we could, we could say you have to work in this way. We could never compel the MPs to give us their biometric data. And, a personal, one personal opinion, nor should we. Um, we can't, we have to trust the users of the system are going to keep it secure. Just like, you know, if you, with your online banking, if you give all your banking credentials to your partner, your wife, your, your, your child, your dog, as someone kept saying about their dog, vote, but clever dog. But um, if, you give your, if you give your details away to somebody, you have compromised that system. And so that's on you as the user, that's not on the system. Um, and if you do that with your bank and you have all your money taken, I think you're fine, your bank doesn't refund it to you. So um, that's about the best we can do. The system is secure and people keep the details secure. The other concern, obviously, as you've touched on there, we were concerned about is making sure that data wasn't being tampered with when it was going through the process. Um, without going into huge detail, we worked closely with the National Cyber Security Centre to, they validated the architecture of our designs to make sure they were happy with it. And um, we had some to and fro around how it should work and um, things and tweaks and uh, evolutions we could make so to make this more secure to prevent um, any, uh, any, 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 any nefarious business taking place. Um, one, I, one example I can give is that they asked for example when we built version one of the system when the texts were sent out it said log into member hub and it gave you a link to member hub and they they asked us to not put a, not put links in uh, text because that it fosters 
bad cyber habits because people get used to clicking tech in, uh, links in text and that makes you uh, susceptible to phishing attacks. So um, that was taken out, for example. But there were some other, uh, other pieces we've done working with them to make sure the system is as robust as possible. Um, and they wrote to the speaker and to our, our managing director to say that, you know, with a, with a report, which they took on board and, and accepted that everything was as it should be. Cool. So before we, uh, before we close, the hour has gone too quick. I just realized. I'm going to get the last word to Nicola. I've um, got one question about whether uh, you guys learn from other parliaments or if you have plans to share learnings uh, with other parliaments across the world. Like, like I mentioned before, this is quite a historic thing, quite a high profile thing, quite a high stakes thing. Obviously, these are laws that affect everyone's uh, lives. Did you, did you learn from other parliaments uh, who already use electronic voting? And do you have plans to share this learning uh, with, other, with other countries as well? Absolutely. So there were, there were lots of conversations that were happening around us. Uh, there were lots of conversations happening with the Brazilian parliament, for example, and, and other parliaments that had gone down this route slightly ahead of us. In terms of the timescales that we had, it was very much head down and needing to deliver something quite quickly. And what we're looking to do now is almost retrospectively share what we've done. And if there's anything we can uh, learn and enhance retrospectively, we would really look to do that. So I know we've got conversations coming up with Australian Parliament, for example, and um, we would definitely look to welcome any conversations with others. Um, because yeah, I think that's a really important part now. We, we've learned a lot. And I think if we did it again, we would do something slightly differently, but you know, we, we, we delivered it and that was the main thing. But yeah, there's definitely a, a, a conversation that we need to have with lots of other people um, to enable them to learn from what we've done and for us to, to learn from others too. All right. Um, unfortunately, we've gone slightly over an hour and I kind of underestimated how interesting and long this conversation could have actually been. But this is so fascinating and I, I want to thank all of our amazing panellists for taking the time uh, today to, to be part of this conversation. Um, and like Hannah and Naz and, and Abin have said, it's really amazing the work uh, you guys, Nicola and Matt, have done uh, to pull around such a historic and important system in four weeks. It is really incredible. And it's quite sad that uh, it is being wrapped up or it appears to be being wrapped up at the moment. Um, very much see this as the start of the conversation. We'll be talking about this uh, a lot more on our, on our Twitter account, but also in general, we'll be we'll doing a lot of research on, into this. And I'll go through the questions as well and see if we can put them to our panellists. Uh, via email. Other than that, I want to thank everyone for, for taking the part to attend and hope you all have a really lovely day. Thank you so much. <laughs>